thank you. Uh, uh, can you hear me, first of all? Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Okay, so I, I can start. Yeah, I'll, I'll do that. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I thank uh, Institute for Studies in Industrial Development, New Delhi, uh, for this uh, uh, for this invitation to deliver this lecture. Uh, I am, uh, yeah, I am thankful for the kind introduction made uh, just now. Uh, yeah, yeah, I have. I will make a presentation uh, for about an hour. Uh, then. Uh, uh, see, my my lecture is, is is not a very long lecture, but I would like to illustrate a lot of my points with number of number of examples. And if the audience uh, uh, like, uh, they can raise their hand or they can ask uh, questions in the chat box. And if uh, you know, if, if uh, somebody can collect those questions and pose it to me, that may be helpful because I'm unable to see the chat box. Uh, that would be so that we can pause, take the questions, and 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 proceed forward. Uh, I hope that uh, I hope that is uh, agreeable. That's so okay. okay, fine. I'll start now. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> right. But the, I, in fact, I first of all I say I titled it somewhat different from what initially I agreed. I put it more sharply as PSU's days numbered. Yeah. So yeah. I I thought it is more. <laughs> Yeah. more sharp and uh, will provocative to for people to for the audience to think about it um, yeah uh, yeah introduction first the finance minister's budget speech on february 1st signaled a decisive turn against public sector i think that's very important uh, she did not say uh, anything particularly against public sector but the whole argument was that that wealth creators should be encouraged. That's the essential argument that uh, if they are privatized, the, the, the establishments will be in the hands of wealth creators, uh, implying that the public sector are not wealth creators. Okay. She proposed, uh, the, the Honorable Finance Minister proposed uh, large scale privatization to raise resources for capital investment for whatever it takes. I mean, she, uh, she was very clear that this, this resources uh, proposed to be realized by privatization will be used for further investment and not for consumption. Uh, this represents a, a clear U-turn in my, from my, as I say, U-turn from the days when public sector was considered commanding heights of India uh, or commanding heights of the Indian economy and PSUs were the temples of modern India. Uh, so it's quite a, a quite a 180 degrees turn from 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 the earlier days. So this lecture, what I would uh, focus on is why and what for this U-turn. Uh, so this is a subject matter of my uh, presentation, my lecture today. Okay, um, fine. Uh, just this is the outline of the lecture. Uh, public sector in India, some facts. Uh, why public sector, a bit of theory. Uh, why public sector, uh, is, it, is it an ideology? Uh, public sector commanding heights, a bit of history. Uh, public sector globally, you get a get an international perspective on it. Public sector performance in India, the reform since ninety one from disinvestment to privatization, and where are we headed? A process. That's the roughly the the structure of the lecture. Uh, first, long term output trends. Uh, as you can see on the screen, uh, on the left side there are two graphs. This they, they depict share of public sector output in GDP. That is, pub, GDP contributed to public sector as a proportion of total GDP. Uh, at, uh, from 1960-61 to 2012-13, as you can see, and as you many of you probably know, the up to 1991 or so, or mid uh, uh, late 1980s, there's a steady rise in the share of public sector output in GDP. And thereafter, it uh, stagnated for about 10 years. Uh, and then it has slowed down. Uh, the, fig the figures stop here at 2013, around 20%, 20, 21% of GDP. Uh, more recent years for which 
this graph doesn't include the data. The, for more recent years, the share has probably declined somewhat to about 19, 20%. So the declining trend is fairly uh, clear for the long period of time. This is the, this is the first, uh, this is the long-term trends in public sector. The data is from the national account statistics. Then we have a uh, composition of public sector output. There are many ways in which one can, uh, one can look at the composition, but I have used the most aggregative measures. If one were to divide public sector output into two categories, one is public administration and defense, which is what, you know, the, uh, the as Adam Smith said, the, the uh, duties of the sovereign. If you include that, the public administration difference, that has remained about 40% of public sector output for a long period of time. And other, others are goods and services, which account for about 60% over the long period. So this is the, this is the rough picture of, of uh, the distribution of uh, public sector output between government proper and the enterprises. Okay. Uh, again, the share of public sector in India is not large by, by comparative standards. Uh, most advanced countries or large countries of the world have a similar sized public sector. But the composition of public sector in advanced countries is very different. Uh, majority of public sector output in those countries relate to welfare activities or social service activities like education, health, uh, social protection. Uh, whereas in developing countries and uh, in many, uh, many Asian industrializing countries, uh, a lot of public sector is on account of production, the goods and services being produced, uh, which pr provide critical inputs for, for the private sector. So that, that, there's a clear distinction between the advanced countries and the developing countries with respect to composition of output. But as a share of GDP, they are roughly the same across the world. Uh, is it clear? Any, any questions? Any, any, if there are any, any queries on the, on the chat box, I would, I would kindly request you to tell me, stop me and tell me, I will be happy to answer. Is it okay? Okay, uh, I go to the next. The kinds of public sector organizations, uh, again, this is a different way of looking at the composition. One is the, the oldest form of, uh, of enterprises were the railways and post offices. Uh, Indian Railway and Indian Post are the, what they call the departmental enterprises. They are enterprises in the sense they produce services for which the citizens pay for the service. And they are run departmentally. They are run like the department of the government. Uh, that's the then comes the central PSUs or central public sector undertakings, which are enterprises mostly registered under the Companies Act, or in some cases they are they were uh, created by an act of the Parliament. So central PSUs like BHEL, ONGC, or uh, BEML, so many of them, uh, they're all enterprises, which were created uh, basically to produce uh, goods and services which were not otherwise produced by the private sector by and large okay so they are the and they are i mean in some sense they represent the temples of modern india as uh, as, as pandit nehru used to used to call okay they are the they are the public sector enterprises they produce goods and services and then there are a large number of state level enterprises state level psus which are again mostly in the area of services. Uh, there used to be a number of uh, production oriented state level PSUs, but I think they are very small and may, most of them I, I guess have been privatized. But it's, most of the state level PSUs deal with welfare activities are basically a, as a way to draw resources from the financial sector to promote a specific sectors or, or specific population targets, like you have a backward class corporations, SCST corporations, uh, basically uh, target oriented uh, activities uh, conceived under the Companies Act. Okay. Then there are the statutory agencies like DVC, which are, uh, which are uh, joint ventures between state governments and such a government. 
Then you also have municipal level services like BEST bus services in Mumbai. I'm sure there are similar services in other states as well. <laughs> but of all these CPSU, central public sector undertakings are most important as they account for a large share of total public investment and output. These are mostly, uh, these are the ones which are being considered for privatization. So that's, that's, the, uh, that's the important part here. Okay. Why public sector? Why public sector? So what I'm saying, some of this may sound very uh, common knowledge to many of you, but I think it's worth uh, repeating it for, for the participants who are, I understand, are college teachers and students. Uh, public ownership is, <coughs> sorry, is equated with socialism, and hence it is believed and desired. I mean, this is a, this is a this is a, a viewpoint or this is an ideological position. Uh, so, uh, therefore, public sector is considered uh, is not desirable. On the other hand, those who believers in socialism or, uh, or communism. Or, they believe the opposite. They, they believe the the expansion of public sector is 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 a is a is a means towards or a or a path towards getting towards socialism and hence hence therefore desirable. So that's the that's the next that's the opposite view. And of course, on the those there are there are this liberal uh, I would say liberal in the Indian sense of the word, not American. Uh, liberal who argue that or libertarians. Uh, would argue that government is the best that governs the least. That's the, I'm sure uh, many of us have heard this uh, organization like Forum of Free Enterprise promote such, uh, such ideology. The government is the best that governs the least, uh, very commonly heard in a lot of popular uh, or populist discourse. And of course, the present government on the, on the Honorable Prime Minister has, has, I mean, has given a slogan, which is roughly similar, uh, I think in this 2014 election campaign, he he coined this term, which has uh, which is still held uh, quite seriously in the government. I guess is minimum government and maximum governance. The slogan of the current government, national government. So therefore, this is an this is a uh, this is an ideological position, uh, which also means that the government should restrict itself to the minimal uh, so mi minimal activities, which which include. Uh, defending the, the national, uh, defending the country, uh, and uh, law and order, police and law and order, and stable currency. And these are the minimalist role of the government, um, as uh, as often argued by libertarians. I think if one, the, the closest I can think of is person like Milton Friedman would be the, the defender of such a view of of the, of the government. Uh, fine. Public sector and theory. I think this is this is where I think the the heart of economics or economic theory comes in. Uh, why public sector? Uh, first of all, important point is, I mean, public sector and private sector have always remained together. I mean, they they are two sides of the same coin in in most countries. Uh, even even the extreme libertarians who believe in uh, in the role of private sector in everything, even they would want a, a stable a government and law and order and basically to create safety for human beings. And uh, so therefore, even the even the extreme libertarians would want uh, what a state, okay, a, a state which protects property and rule of law. Okay. Uh, right. Uh, so that's the that's that, that's one position. In, in mainstream economics, important argument for the public sector comes from, from market failures. Again, this is a very, very elementary economics. Any student of uh, um, undergraduate economics would have heard about these things. The state intervention uh, is required whenever market fails. And we know market, uh, market often fails because the information which the which the buyers and sellers of any commodity, any any good or service, is not the same. Okay, market failures are a pretty common feature in in many markets. Okay, so therefore, when markets fail, and there is a uh, there is a suboptimal or uh, suboptimal outcomes, 
therefore, the, the, effic the, the efficiency uh, of the markets is not upheld. And therefore, uh, you need uh, state intervention to correct for the market. So this is a, I mean, this goes uh, go to the heart of economics or one of the most prominent ex exponents of, of this view, particularly with respect to information imperfections is, is, is Joseph Stiglitz, the Nobel laureate. Okay. So this is the, uh, so there's a need for state intervention comes in because the markets fail very often. Then comes the argument of missing markets. This is, this is particularly, uh, this is particularly uh, significant for developing countries where very often markets simply do not exist. Markets have to be created. I mean, like, uh, like put it this way, I mean, uh, one can think of many examples. You require, see, even today, there, there are no in, in the markets for insurance markets. Or if I were to take from the goods, I mean, if you take underdeveloped country, if you want to develop uh, an industrial uh, establishment in a, in a backward area, there are no there are no facilities. Uh, I mean, I can uh, see I, from my uh, my PhD I mean, long ago, which I did studying the Indian telephone industries uh, in Bangalore, which was a public sector agency uh, firm created in uh, in Bangalore in 1949. When ITI was set up, uh, it's an interesting uh, history. The, you know, there are no there are no private firms who could who could who could produce enough packing cases to pack the the pack the uh, you know equipment being produced or manufactured by ITI. So, per force ITI had to be, create a vertically integrated plant even to produce packing cases. I mean, it's just an example of how markets are missing and where the state has to expand itself to create those markets. Okay, so missing markets is, is a common phenomenon when uh, modernization happens in a, in, a, in, a, in a country or industrialization happens in backward areas. So state has to extend lots of activities, lots of, to, to take care of the missing markets. So this is another argument for public sector. Then natural monopolies. There are, we know that there are cases where natural monopolies, where the, the, the marginal cost drops sharply with the expansion of the uh, of, of, of the uh, of the networks like like railways or water supplies okay then it's not it's not it is not economical to have two parallel railway lines for the getting to the same same region, same locations similarly water supply they are they are natural monopolies okay so uh, and there are immense economies of scale in 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 uh, in, some, in providing these services uh, so again, this provides, uh, if, if it's a natural monopoly, the question comes whether it should be a public monopoly or a private monopoly. So uh, in such situations, which are, uh, it's often better to have a public monopoly because when, if it's a public monopoly, then there is a uh, accountability, not just to the market, but through, but through the political process or through the civil society. So uh, when in the case of natural monopolies, it makes sense to have public monopolies rather than private monopolies. Okay, this is the third argument. The fourth argument, I think, is very, very well understood in India is national and strategic interests. See, economic policy works within the confines of a, of a national state. Uh, there's nothing like a perfectly free market across, across countries. The economic policy has to work within the framework of, of the national states and protect the national interests. Given that, there are many activities which has to be done within, within the boundaries of the country. So, uh, so for example, I mean, defense production. Defense production, uh, uh, for, for many practical reasons, has to be uh, has to be done domestically. Uh, okay. So this is a, a another reason, argument. Then comes uh, an argument from public uh, for macroeconomics uh, in favor of uh, public sector is public investment can crowd in private investment in a situation where there's a, there's a demand shortage. Okay, so this is, a, this is an argument for public sector. Like if there is, if there is, a, if, there is uh, if the economy is operating with less than full, full employment capacity, 
or there's a there's a lot of excess capacity in, in the in the in the economy or on of the interest rates are very low or close to zero then public investment can create facilities which will in turn bring in private investment like uh, just i mean this is something which we all know in india uh, uh, when public investment happens in infrastructure it brings in private investment uh, best example i can think of is creating uh, road networks if there is a, a road connecting all villages then you will find the private individuals will invest in cycles motorcycles and cars and uh, and their buses which will this is a which contributes to to further economic activity is a virtuous circle of of growth being created with initial public investment uh, and finally public uh, public sector has a role in in economic stabilization when when economy is uh, has uh, is uh, is facing uh, instability on account of on account of external imbalances or internal imbalances uh, in such situation public sector can create can create uh, stability like basically monetary policy and fiscal policy, particularly fiscal policy which can have a very quick effect on 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 demand or supply or okay. can can boost the economic activity quickly to uh, to correct for uh, for the economic instability so these are these are the arguments usually made in favor of public public interventions and public investments and public sector public sector basically uh, instruments of carrying public uh, public policy uh, is it clear any any questions or any clarifications required uh, should i pause for a minute or is it fine should i continue hello are you are you yes, are you hear me is it is it clear can you hear me hello uh, you, you continue please sir okay okay yeah i just wanted to make sure that because i am unable to see the the audience therefore i am just yeah, not sure yeah. okay okay so i'll continue i'll continue um, okay public sector in practice this is this is important um, world over public and private sectors coexist in varying proportions across industries uh this is an important uh this is an important point that while the ideologues may may favor one or the other uh in reality they, these are uh two different ways of coordinating economic activity and uh to meet the national uh, national goals so in most countries public and private sectors coexist but how they coexist and what industries they coexist and what activities can vary across uh, across countries uh, right right as a relative roles vary across countries over time political regimes or political regimes over technology conditions yeah i i must mention why political regimes because uh, we find that same activity uh, and the different political regimes changes the ch changes from public sector to private sector or vice versa or it may even change even with the same political activity uh, uh, political uh, regime continues uh, i can give you a best example like one can think of is the the privatization or uh, nationalization and renationalization of uh, british rail in britain over the last maybe nearly 100 years Uh, since 19 uh, 19 i mean uh, say after the second world war uh, this has seen several swings from the public to the private and private to the public and this has happened regardless of the the political party in power uh, and uh, the latest twist in this uh, or latest swing which is expected now is is renationalization of of privatized uh, railways in the in, in britain you may recall that uh, mrs thatcher uh, uh, in late 70s and early 80s privatized the british rail uh, and today the same conservative government which is in power is very keen to renationalize them because they believe that the privatization privatized ent entities are really not serving the public interest so <clears throat> the point is that the 
the relative boundaries of public and private sectors keep varying across time uh, over uh, over countries and uh, and uh, with the same political regimes with the change of times you know the the boundaries change so it's it's very it's uh, so there will therefore there's nothing fixed about it that's that, that's something it's all it's all context specific okay and and the third point which has which is often not appreciated uh is regulation of private sector and public ownership are often substitutes yeah this is uh, see uh, again we we often think of uh, when, when we all, when we think of public uh, sector or private sector we think in terms of pure categories as if private enterprise working in in, in free markets and public enterprise which is com completely controlled by by the government but in reality there are there is whole continuum of possibilities between them uh i can give you an example like like uh, like say uh, telecom industry before it before the uh, before the mobile phone revolution happened uh, some two decades ago world over telecom industry was highly regulated like the british the, the uk the us telecom was controlled was owned by two or three uh, uh, companies uh, bell telephones and its subsidiaries but they were so highly regulated that it was as good as as a public enterprise uh, again electricity sector electricity generation and distribution in us is 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 entirely in, in private sector but it is so strictly regulated that it is almost similar to public publicly owned uh, uh, electricity sector in europe or or, or in, in japan so therefore regulation and ownership can be substitutes and uh, and therefore highly regulated private sector is can be can be close to public ownership okay in terms of in terms of its uh, function so therefore uh, the point of saying all this is you know one should not look at this in purely ideological uh, terms but one should think that practically how the industries function when you look at it highly regulated public sector uh, highly regulated private sector and publicly owned ent entities often tend to be similar in in their uh, in their um, uh, behavior and performance okay hence there is a continuum between public and private sector to achieve the national goals so this is this is the the reality of of public sector across the world okay okay uh, public sector in reality continuing world over world over roads sports railways water supply largely tend to be publicly owned and operated this is a this is a bold statement uh, this is a i don't have numbers here with me but this is roughly true uh, this is uh, this is something which uh which a lot of popular or populist literature often overlooks uh for example in fact this is something which i often would like to mention it look like the highway network very what was the story or wide, widely you know appreciated the you know interstate uh highway networks in the us uh they are mostly owned owned and operated by state level agencies they are owned by state government they are not privately owned or they are not mostly ppps there is something i mean the why i mentioning is very often there is lot of you know lot of misinformation or you know uh, uh, wrong i mean uh, popular beliefs are are quite at variance with the reality okay so therefore these large infrastructure industries like roads ports railways are mostly even today are publicly owned and operated their organizational forms may change uh you know depending upon the situations but if you look closely they are directly or indirectly publicly owned by the national agencies or state level or local agencies so this is this is a, again i am making a bold statement but i think this is roughly true across the country secondly strategic industries like rail like airlines shipping lines petroleum and gas are mostly publicly owned uh or if not strategically controlled this is important 
again, again this is a you know this is a, um, this is again very not widely appreciated uh, when when often i give these lectures uh, people would come back and say look the america doesn't have american airlines are mostly private okay it's it's a private pub, you know it's a privately owned and operated airline so it's it's a it's a private enterprise but one doesn't realize that airlines in the us are highly regulated foreign the 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 regular the foreign airlines ability to compete in the domestic market is very 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 low they cannot similarly you uh, know uh, communication as uh, say broadcasting uh, airways like even an organization like bbc cannot cannot uh, uh, it is a british organization cannot uh, cannot start a, a, a broadcasting uh, radio broadcasting services station in the us there are regulations foreign ships how a foreign ship how many points it can touch at a point you know in the us are regulated so the point of saying giving this uh, detailed examples is that many of these those seemingly privately owned and operated they are highly regulated industries across the world and i give examples from the us because very often we take us as a as an epitome of a free enterprise which it is not many industries are highly regulated in the us i'll give an example even today if you were to travel if you were to tra to travel on american us and us government account you cannot travel in any airline other than the american owned airlines so therefore the image is something like similar to what india used to have if you if you're traveling on government account you had to travel by air india and i know most of us who travel on government accounts you know we usually crib about it okay but in the us they say it's our policy okay so the part and i'm not i'm not trying to say what india was doing right or what america is doing wrong. i'm not making that point the point of saying all this is that how public sector operates how private sector is highly regulated which is almost like a you know mimics a public sector you know they are very specific to industries and countries which often are overlooked in popular discourse i mean that's that's a simple point so the popular discourse on public and private sector is simply black and white whereas most of it in world over is is hugely gray okay again i'll give another example uh, like uh, uh, japan post india no, like we, we also have india post now Jap see, japan post is the largest collector of domestic savings in japan even today okay and and uh, and therefore and japanese uh, citizens have immense trust in their own post office and which offers a marginally higher interest rate than the the market interest rates uh, so this is a medium through which japan collects the national savings and gives it to uh, development banks for long term investments and entire system is publicly owned or highly regulated Okay. and in the uh, about 15 years ago uh, uh, when kozumi was the uh, was the president uh, or uh, sorry premier of japan he sought to privatize Jap japan post but it was immensely opposed and he could not do it and i, I think he lost elections on this count okay so therefore the point is that large institutions in the, in 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 the, in the uh, In, in in the world are still publicly owned again i'll give another example volkswagen i'm sure all of us are familiar with this car company okay which is 40% owned or its equity 40% equity is owned by the provincial by a provincial government in germany i think if i'm not mistaken it is saxony which owns 40% i am not sure of the fact but i'm sure it's 40% so why i'm mentioning all this is in reality the public sector has a large role Uh, though varying across countries industries which is often not seen in public discourse okay we see everything is private sector and india should move towards it so the, i'm trying to correct a lot of popular misconceptions okay any questions from what i said i think i've said enough uh, controversial thing any 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 questions should i pause for a minute There is one question in chat box if you want to take. Please. 
So there is a question written on the chat box. Can can I can we read it for you or please you? please yeah I can't see please read it for me. So traditionally we are doing all that under government sector, the so-called natural monopolies that is railway, road, and water supply. Because the idea of modern state is not new and it has been organized so, had long history, so it was continued and going on. But what can we rethink on that aspect, whether to have an open policy for all such activities? Any comments here, views? I mean, I think the, 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 uh, the person who has asked the question is right. It's historically been done publicly, but of late, there is a view, uh, I think, in India that look, they want to privatize. In fact, if you recall in the present budget, the, 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 uh, the Honorable Finance Minister said that she would like to privatize uh, certain sections of, of railways and, uh, I mean, she used the word not privatize, she called it monetize. She monetize uh, certain, uh, certain sections of uh, railways like the, the new uh, freight corridor, which is being built. I don't think it's been fully built, but even before it is fully built, the present government is considering to monetize it. Monetize, effectively you are selling the, the, uh, the revenue streams coming out of, potentially coming out of that, uh, that uh, assets or that investment. Okay, this is basically privatization of not ownership, but of the stream of income coming out of it. Okay, uh, and I suppose we want to uh, uh, emulate uh, privatization uh, as it happened in, in, in England and say in France, like even the, even the uh, monopolies like uh, water supply, uh, municipal water supply has been privatized in, in UK and in France with, uh, with very disastrous effects. Okay, and and those countries are rethinking about some of these, but I think the present government, in its uh, whatever, in its uh, political zeal, uh, seem to be see, trying to do what uh, those countries did some 20 years ago. So I think that that's that, that's what I was reacting to when I said when I gave these examples. Uh, I don't know whether that answers the question. Uh, I'll be happy to take any further uh, questions on this. Uh, if there are no, no further questions, I will continue. Or is there any question there? You continue, sir. Sir, please, sir. Okay, fine. Mm. Okay, here are some, uh, some, here are some facts. Uh, this, is a, this is an interesting graph. I have, uh, I have taken this from Professor Sushil Khanna's uh, presentation we made recently. He talks about the PSU share, public enterprises share among, among countries top 10 firms. If it, he was trying to say that the public sector is, is dominant in many countries in, in the top forms. So there, and here is, a, here is a list. You can see that a country like China is about 96, 98%. Even in Germany, public sector is 11%. And India stands in somewhere at 59%. So the point is that the public sector is, is important in among the top, top firms uh, in the country. And I can think that in particularly in say in, uh, in uh, United Arab uh, Emirates, Russia, Indonesia, Malaysia, Saudi Arabia, top firms are mostly uh, uh, natural resource firms, basically oil producing firms or oil refining, refining firms. And as I said, oil globally is considered a, a, a strategic asset. And therefore it is, it is uh, in, invariably can, in, owned and controlled by 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 government, so therefore that's what this uh, this graph shows. But unfortunately, or fortunately, in India now we are very keen to to sell even the uh, even the uh, oil firms like BCPL, um, uh, Bharat Petroleum, and uh, other other firms are being privatized now. I think if the, the privatization process is on. So what is the thinking? Uh, about this in government, I do not understand. They seem to be going against the uh, the conventional wisdom of considering oil as a strategic asset. Okay. Uh, again, I'll go to the next another graph here. Again, PSUs in the Fortune 
global 500 list. Again, this is, I have borrowed it from Professor Sushil Khanna's recent presentation. Here is an employment share. You have a revenue share and a share by assets and profits. You can see that in uh, among the top uh, 500 fortune uh, companies, uh, one can see that public sector is fairly significant in the number of number of issue, uh, number of uh, state-owned enterprises. The share ranges from say 19% to 30%. Share of revenue ranges from 8% to 24%. So therefore, the point is that public sector is not dead and gone as a lot of popular. Uh, mythology may may want to like to uh, like to uh, project public sector is alive and kicking in in not just in poor countries or ideologically uh, uh, driven countries towards the left or towards socialism but even among the advanced uh, market oriented economies uh, public sector continues to have a fairly significant share and that's the point of this uh, this table Okay, then why is PSU's poor performance? This is important. See, I think uh, many, uh, I understand this course, you have a lot of teachers and, and uh, students here in this course. Uh, from what I've said so far, seem to be at variance with a lot of popular, popular uh, statistics dished out uh, in Indian media uh, and by government. Uh, if you if one picks up newspapers, one will see a large number of examples of poor financial performance of public sector. And this is a this is something which is common. Every second or third day newspaper, if you pick up, there is invariably a news item saying that how uh, a certain public sector enterprise's net worth, net worth has been eroded by its losses. Okay, how uh, uh, how government has to uh, how how government has to uh, has to subsidize, uh, um, has to make good for the losses of uh, enterprises like Air India. Okay, so this is a, this is the common refrain. Or one also finds lots of CAG reports, you know, uh, Comptroller and Audit General reports, which which focus on the financial performance of public sector, and and often give the give the the uh, the information that these are loss making enterprises. And these losses are a, are, are a big millstone around the government's neck. Okay, I mean, that's a standard. Uh, so therefore, I think a lot of students and you know, uh, maybe teachers here would, would, be, uh, would be wondering how my, uh, um, my description of public sector previously, I mean, earlier, and this popular perception are quite at variance. Okay, uh, I think uh, the, the reasons are pretty simple. The reasons are pretty simple. The reason is that these are basically financial accounting results. It is true. In fact, there is no, uh, there is, there is no fact. Nothing was factually wrong when CAG points out that the net as a net worth of a particular public enterprise is eroded, and therefore it needs to be shut down or whatever. But the reality is, why did they, why does it happen that way? Okay, uh, but the answer to this lies in answer lies in in what what public sector does for the government or what what kind of uh, what kind of non financial activities they perform, which makes them you no know, which which incurs those losses. I'll, I'll come to that next 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 slide. True, there are inefficiencies in public sector. No doubt about it. We all know. Uh, we all know that from top to bottom, from ministers to the lowly uh, officials, would like to use public sector enterprises as milch cow for basically as a common property. Everybody would like to 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 take uh, make misuse the public property. That's a, that's a standard thing everywhere. Okay, uh, and. PSUs often suffer from or face soft budget constraint. That is, they do not exit if they make financial losses. Everybody knows that the government cannot, cannot uh, close down public enterprises because they have to protect uh, uh, labor. Uh, 
and uh, it's a political issue the closing down is a public enterprise becomes a political issue therefore they will be supported by the budget so this is a common knowledge among people therefore people would like to use public sector as a milk cow but there is a lot more to public sector performance which does not meet the eye public sector enterprises often make non financial contribution which are not factored in PSUs remain extended arm of government asked to perform many national tasks for which they do not get get financial rewards or they do not get compensated from the budget for the uh, uh, for the uh, for the services they render i'll give a simple example which uh, i'm sure many of you would be aware uh, see you have the at the state level uh, you have two major sectors which are important one is the road transport corporations and state electricity boards okay which are which account for bulk of the losses of, uh, of public sector enterprises uh, uh, so like state uh, state transport corporations they are often asked to provide subsidies for uh, for students subsidies for government employees uh, uh, so, or subsidized services for uneconomic uh, uh, transport routes for which for which they are not compensated so this is a these are the functions which the public sector enterprises perform as a as part of the public policy requirements so psus effectively are extended arms of the government where they are expected to perform duties of the state whether or not they are compensated for the services they render this is an important part which is often not uh, not taken into account just when looking at the financial performance obviously the finances will not reflect this right so that's the reason why you find that the financial performance of public sector enterprises often tends to be poor okay okay, uh, okay. having said that having said that i would say that look in the aggregate see it's always possible to pick up uh, or you know uh, uh, pick up loss making perform uh, loss making enterprises uh, if you are a critic of public and public enterprises or one can pick up profit making enterprises if one is talking in favor of public sector this is what happens in lots of popular and you no know, uh, popular uh, discourse so to avoid that to avoid that what i have done in fact in my earlier research uh, i think i have provided some readings for the, for this purpose uh, look at public sector enterprises as a whole and see how they performed and i have also used different criterion for their performance most often the uh, you know the popular criticism financial criticism lies with with respect to return on equity or uh, return whereas if you look at savings or return on capital employed you find that public sector has not performed as badly as it is often made out to be okay so this is this is a point which i have uh, repeatedly said and i have written about it uh, reason is public sector have large amount of assets which which are which are depreciated so the uh, lots of their revenue gets written off as as depreciation okay uh, therefore if one looks at returns uh, or say returns on capital employed you find that that public sector performance has systematically been improving over a long period of time okay so from a which which measure is correct whether one should take the return from a uh, from an equity point of view or should we take it from a uh, from return on capital employed i would think from an economic point of view from a national economic point of view what is important is return on capital employed because it includes both both debt and equity okay so therefore that's a, that's a is a more comprehensive measure and when one looks at that one finds that the public sector performance has been steadily improving and when i make this point uh, in my seminars and, uh, and lectures 
often say it is mainly on account of the oil enterprises which have which basically uh, make profits because of cost plus pricing because you know the pricing is in the hands of the government and the government keeps increasing prices and therefore the oil companies make profits okay but i have done my calculations even excluding uh, excluding oil enterprises and one finds the trend is identical okay so this is what i would show i mean I, what i'm going to show is somewhat uh, what to say counterintuitive but uh, please have a look at uh, my numbers okay here is on the on the left side we have the uh, cpa central public enterprises profitability uh, it is from 1974 to 2011 Uh, actually i have uh, i have more recent paper which has data for 2016 or so i could not update it in this graph uh, i didn't have time but uh, if you look at my older papers on public sector you will find them uh, in there but what's important is there is a steady improvement from around 5% in 74 when, when which is i would say really the, the very poor period for for public sector and the economy as a whole was doing very badly but you found that it has really improved over time okay profit of okay. uh and you see the two graphs the even net of petroleum enterprises the 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 overall trend doesn't change very much okay so this is a view which i take i know there are not many takers for my view uh, my my view is in the minority in public discourse in india but i i don't i, I don't get tired of you no know, uh, stating my my position based on facts okay so this is my my, my position kindly uh, mull it over think it over i'll be happy to to have a discussion with the, with the audience on this okay then have another point here see you know that public sector pricing is a big issue very often public sector output is is highly highly subsidized which basically helps the private sector i mean it's not not need not, need not necessarily the private sector firms but including consumers okay so if you take a relative price relative price of public sec uh, private sector price to public sector price or say or say uh, i would say public sector gdp uh, public sector deflator to gdp deflator uh, again i i I'll, i'll explain again this is you know you have national account statistics you have public sector output uh, in both current and constant prices similarly gdp at current and constant prices okay you take the the divide one by the other you will get the implicit deflator the or implicit price uh price indicator okay you you compare the price indicator of public sector versus gdp you find that the public the the trend has gone down which means the public sector prices have risen at a pace lower than the gdp deflator price which means the public sector prices have risen at a lower rate than the gdp which means the public sector has been underselling its it, itself why does it happen because public sector pricing is in the hands of the government not in the hands of the enter, uh, or the enterprise most often right and this is this is most clear with respect to railways you, you can see from my graph which is a dotted line or the line uh, the, which is more the steepest uh, downwards or a long period up see these are not short term figures they are long term trends okay long term trends are you know far more robust okay and they show a, an importance they tell an important story how public sector pricing is 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 the real culprit okay look at public sector uh, uh, prices suppose it was 100 in 19 uh, 1991 okay the the railways are charging only 60% of it in in 2013 which means the public the railways is underselling itself relative to rise in gdp uh, uh, gdp deflator are you are you getting anyway you, you may have questions i'll be happy to answer okay I, i'll give you an intuitive example for this I, for the same period okay see when i joined igidr in mumbai in 1992 i used to pay 10 rupees to travel from goregaon to church gate when i retired and left last year i still paid 10 rupees whereas my salary had gone up by by many fold okay and that is true of say average salaries in in mumbai okay which means that the price of 
price of uh, railway uh, service had declined uh, enormously compared to the uh, the general prices or even uh, average income levels in bombay okay and that is how railways are underselling themselves and that's a, that's an important reason why their financial performance is poor in fact uh, in fact i i once uh, three four recently uh, three four years ago in one of those budget uh, you know pre budget meetings uh, at the request of the uh, the minister at that time you know i made the simple point that don't give any subsidies to to railways but allow them to charge increase prices to the same extent as gdp deflator or the general price increase you don't have to supply any subsidy or any financial support from the budget they will have enough resources for their own investments okay and he was uh, he was surprised he asked me to to give a detailed note which i did of course nothing happened out well but so the point of saying all this uh, the side story is look public sector pricing is is a critical factor for poor financial performance this is something which you know which cag never will look at because that's not their mandate okay they only look at the financial performance okay so the the point of all saying all this is when you say public sector is performing poorly financially very often we overlook and what under what circumstances they function under under what macro policy environment they function and here is here is the the hidden story my 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 right hand graph to the the, the the critical story which is often missed in uh, in, in public discourse okay. so if public sector is allowed to charge reasonably commercial uh, fares or commercial rates i think they will not their their financial performance will increase so this is not to say that there are no inefficiencies uh, please uh, do not get me wrong this is not to say there are no uh, there are no inefficiencies there are we all know about it. okay but they will be far less serious if you accept that the real culprit is public policy which doesn't allow enterprises to perform commercially well okay uh, i think i have said enough controversial stuff if there are any questions i'll be happy to take so the house is open for question answer uh, so participate okay participate okay so uh, you want me to continue do so you do you have more uh, more slides sir yeah yeah yes yeah, yeah. so very few not not too many not too many okay okay Okay, you go ahead, sir. Then okay, you... okay, okay, okay. So disinvestment and privatization are they different? Yes, they are different. Difference is in the extent of private ownership and control. That's the, that's disinvestment means you have, there's a partial selling of equity uh, in the market. They are mostly sold in the in the stock market. Okay. Disinvestment usually means floating of PSU shares in the stock market, with majority shares and management control still with the government. I mean that is the usual definition of uh, disinvestment. Privatization means selling of majority shares to private party, or uh, the euphemism for it these days is strategic investor. Okay, and transferring management control. Okay, so there, this is the difference. In privatization, there is a clear change in the on the in the management control. in disinvestment management control still largely lies with the government how largely depends upon the government's share in it like public sector banks still have uh, are publicly um, government control because the public uh, uh, ownership of uh, bank equities 51% or above still in most cases okay uh, so therefore uh, that's the difference between uh, the disinvestment and privatization one may say that the previous uh, uh, governments uh, uh, since 1991 have preferred privatization as a means of increasing efficiency and they did not uh, they did not usually go in for privatization because they they believe that uh, efficiency improvement will happen if there is a discipline from the stock market okay how credible that is is open to question both theoretically and in practice but that was the argument therefore the previous governments did not openly 
uh, advocate and proceed with, uh, with privatization, they mostly stuck to disinvestment. Okay, the present government is is uh, is uh, is going ahead. Uh, they are, uh, and they, as they believe, the private sector is the wealth creator, not the private public sector. So that's their uh, that's the view. Okay, I mean this is a this is a nice uh, cartoon. I thought worth uh, sharing with you. Again, this is a courtesy uh, Sushil Khanna. Okay, arguments for privatization. Competition or you know market competition will eliminate inefficiencies, rise profits, reduce subsidies, budgetary burden will decline. So that's the standard you know uh, market friendly approach and the standard argument, you no know, basic microeconomic argument. Uh, it, ideological, it is not the business of government to do business. In fact, finance secretary yesterday in an interview to Times into I think Indian Express said, should government be in the business of business? It should be a catalyst. An enabler, and that's his answer. So that is that is from Secretary of Finance. So I mean, that tells what the government's thinking is today. Okay. What is practical? PSU losses are a major uh, practical argument is PSU losses are a major burden on the government, which needs to be reduced to find resources for infrastructure investment and the new welfare measures like free LPG connection, Jal Nal scheme, all that. So the government is saying we will we will not utilize this money for consumption but we will use it for investment in new welfare schemes or for investments so therefore it will augment growth and it will put, put the enterprises in the hands of people who are wealth creators not wealth destroyers okay then arguments against most psus are not this is an important point most psus do not operate in competitive industries this is important most uh, most public enterprises operate in strategic high technology resource industries where market failures are serious. This is the biggest uh, theoretical argument against privatization. So the simple, you know, simple or simplistic market principle uh, will not uh, be helpful in, in, in improving efficiency by privatization. Because these, these large public sector uh, enterprises work in industries which are by definition non-competitive and where uh, strategic interests are very significant. Okay. In fact, PSUs in the aggregate make considerable profits as shown above. As we, government has been raiding PSUs reserves for meeting fiscal debt. This is an important point, often not missed out unless somebody, somebody is following the, the budget documents call closely or the newspapers closely. <coughs> Sorry. Government has been raiding the, the reserves of uh, some of the oil-rich uh, public, uh, public undertakings to meet fiscal deficit. So what it means? It means that public sector enterprises are essentially creatures of public policy. And they, are, they have very little identity as an enterprise. Okay, So they perform whatever the policy asks them to do. Okay. So that so that's it. So unless public and public enterprises have an identity of their own, they will not be able to resist the change which is coming from their ultimate owner, that is the government. Okay. Even if the PSUs are privatized, they will remain highly regulated. This is an important point, which I we started earlier or mentioned about. They're all highly regulated industries, hence distinction between highly regulated private enterprise and PSUs will remain thin. So if if the if the distinction is going to remain very thin for reasons of various market failures which we discussed, then what is the big deal in privatization? Why undergo this privatization at all in the first place? That's the question. Where are we headed? Arguments, uh, sorry for the wrong spelling, uh, for privatization are weak, both in theory and experience. This is, this is what the economic literature tells. Okay, I fully agree with that. Surely the boundaries between public and private sector needs to be reviewed periodically. This is important. I am not wedded to uh, that the, the view should be static. No, it needs to be reviewed periodically. Redrawing boundaries should be pragmatic, not ideological, keeping in view long-term national interest. I think this, in my view, is the critical, uh, which I, I tend to believe the government seems to be overlooking. Okay. Surely PSUs need to be modernized and greater financial and strategic autonomy is need to be given to them. 
we cannot say the, 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 they should be run the same way as they were running in 60s and 70s. No, they, the world has changed. The, how firms organize are changed. The organization of production and you know, finances behind them have changed. Public sector needs to be, uh, need to be modernized. <laughs> but the ownership can still remain in the public sector without losing its, its, its uh, assigned role for national development. So I conclude here. Budget has proposed privatization in a big way, more, more out of ideological considerations, in my view, not pragmatic or national, not in not pragmatic and not in national interest. PSUs need improvements for sure to get better returns for the country, both, uh, both uh, financial returns and social returns. But the baby, but should the baby be thrown out with the bathwater? I think that's a million dollar question, literally. That's that's my my view. That's, should the baby be thrown out with the with the bathwater? Okay, our PSUs days numbered. Experience suggests that selling PSUs may not be easy because anywhere in the world, large large scale uh, privatization. See, because most of these enterprises have enormous. They're all networked industries. They have enormous connections with various other industries. Okay, uh, other sectors. Uh, therefore, privatization will not be easy. I mean, if one were to go by the experience of how, what it took Germany after re reunification with East Germany it took, what it took five or six years to privatize the enterprises in East Germany. And even that with enormous financial backing of, the, of, the, of, of, of West Germany. So you can imagine even, even a country, rich country with enormous resources enormous expertise took several years to, to privatize. So I think we will probably take much longer if, it, if at all. So I think that's the way. But that's no solace. I mean, that's not solace uh, saying that they'll, they, they'll not be able to do. The PSUs need to be strengthened in the national interest and strategic interests. I think that's, that's important. I believe uh, this may be my ideological position, but I'm Maybe I'm wrong, but my view is not as much ideological. I still believe in what uh, uh, what the Chinese saying is. I'm not bothered about the color of the cat as long as it catches mice. Okay, that's my view on on public sector. So, but I think the here public sector has an uh, important role to play, given our relative really backward country we are and and our aims of our aim of becoming a, a developed nation in 20 years. And so, I think. Uh, public sector needs to be strengthened and modernized rather than privatized. I think that's my view. I stop here. Thank you very much. I think, uh, uh, Professor Navaraj, I think there are a few questions.